Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our November 27th regular meeting of the Webster Central School District. Would you please stand with us and join us as we say the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Board, may I have a motion, please, to move out of the executive session? So, go ahead. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. You've had a chance to look at the agenda. There will be an alteration to tonight's meeting. We are going to move Section 5A to our next meeting, December 5th. Are there any other alterations? Are you going to move things around? Uh, well, yeah, we'll, it'll just be that letter E, but that'll, okay. all right, we're, good. we're okay with that. Um, motion, please, to accept tonight's agenda. So, so. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Okay, the motion is carried, and we will proceed with tonight's meeting. Amy, I believe you would like to speak tonight. C Cindy, you've got all the regular details, so you don't need all that. your time. Um, <clears throat> I did want to, um, to thank you first and foremost for the forum on Saturday and I think it required an awful lot of courage and I think that it was, um, there was a lot of controversy at that meeting but I think that on, on the bright side I think that there was an overwhelming positive response uh, and support for your teachers and um, so for me that was the takeaway that I, that I came with that that was very positive. Um, but there were some things, and, and I'm just I'm going to ask you just to consider a couple things um, based on what I heard on Saturday and just based on my experiences. Um, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is please neutralize your relationship with state education and, and also with Commissioner King. Um, I understand that there are mandates that you need to abide by. But I think that we run the risk in this district of the perception of perhaps a conflict of interest when we go so far above and beyond in support of state ed and the commissioner by sending representatives to forums, um, by making common core videos, by, by being a, a, a lab district. Um, so I would ask you just to reconsider and make your relationship a little more neutral with state ed um, the second thing I'm going to ask is that we please um, stop the intense focus on pride. Um, and, and that's not to say that we shouldn't celebrate good work, and I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be a celebration here um, today, and, and there should be. But I'm going to ask that you, that you allow people to come here and not just have pride-based things to say, that you encourage people to come and talk about things that maybe they're struggling with um, to provide a balanced approach. I think you're going to get a, an ELA presentation today, and I'm sure that there's a lot to be celebrated. Um, but there are also some significant concerns, and I don't think you're going to hear those tonight because I don't know that people feel that they're allowed to come here with them. So I'm hoping that maybe we can put the pride aside for a little bit and be Webster humble. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to ask is that you as board members, if you could please um, clarify and define for constituents exactly what your positions are on a lot of, a lot of the, um, the controversial issues today in education. Um, specific, and we know that you are robust supporters of the Common Core Standards, that we know. Um, I don't know how you feel about APPR, I'm not sure your position on the testing. And Pearson, um, I don't know how you feel about InBloom. I don't know what you feel about the data sharing um, and, and that sort of thing. And I think it's important and I think it's a reasonable request from constituents to, to, to ask that you help us understand where, where you stand on things and how you're representing us so that we can help in some way um, to support the district and support your teachers. Um, so that's all I had today, and I appreciate, again, I appreciate your efforts, I appreciate your volunteering, 
I know these are trying times, and I know you guys are sticking it out. Um, and I, I do appreciate it, and I do appreciate being welcomed and being listened to. So thanks again. Thank you, Amy. Is there anyone else from the audience that would like to address the board tonight? Okay, I do have some comments uh, that relate to what Amy said tonight. You know, in Webster, we realize that a single test does not measure the worth of a child. That's why we seek multiple means to determine the growth and success of students' performance and achievement. Likewise, when we evaluate the effectiveness of a school district, one measure does not tell us the whole picture of the district. Just as we do with a student, multiple means are used to evaluate the performance and growth a district has experienced. One of those measures is the information we received from the Career, College, and Community Readiness Focus Group uh, that was conducted last spring by Juanita Davies. Another such measure is the data and comments that we, will, that we will receive from the survey that has presently been given to our students and our staff and our community members. A third measure is information that we receive from the public forum. All of this information, plus more, will be used to help us set the future direction and vision of the district. I would like to turn our attention to the public forum that was held this past Saturday at the Public Library. The board would like to thank all those individuals who took the time to share with us their concerns. One of the core beliefs that we have is that we can always improve, continuous improvement. This past Saturday, you suggested ways we can improve. You told us that we need clearer communication. Not only do we need to be mindful of the number of ways the district communicates, but also mindful of communicating what is changing and why it is changing. We also, we all enjoy hearing the many positive of, positives of our district but we also must communicate the challenges that we face. You told us that we need to improve our consistency. Consistency not only in our programs and instructions, but also consistency between and among our buildings. You told us to act with compassion to all members of our school community. You told us to look for ways in which to improve our collabor collaborative efforts, particularly with parents. And you told us that if schools are truly to be special, to find ways in which students and teachers alike can find avenues to explore and excel in their creativity. You acknowledge the dedication and excellence of our teachers. You acknowledge the value of the public forum with the board and the way in which the forum was communicated. And we also heard your specific concerns that dealt with the topics of special education and the Common Core. To that end, the board will use the communications used for Saturday's forum as a model for future communications. To that end, the board will encourage consistencies throughout the district where appropriate. To that end, and regarding special education, the board will ask the policy committee to review the policies and regulations involving special education, and in addition, the board and district will seek ways to collabor collaborate with parents so that they feel like partners in the special education process. To that end, the board will continue its strategic planning work, ensuring that creativity is included in the academic portion of the strategic plan. To that end, the board will conduct more public workshops for parents and the board to explore educational issues. To that end, the board will seek additional means for parents and community members to express their concerns. We believe the open exchange of ideas will help build trust and confidence. We know we have work to do, and we are excited to be able to work on this together with board, district staff, and community. We are stronger and smarter together. And that's 
comments from the board. Thank you. With that being said, we'll move on to our liaisons. And who's going first today? Okay. All right, Mary, tell us all about uh, what's happening at Thomas. Good evening, board members. This month at Webster Thomas has been filled with outstanding accomplishments from our students. Last week, we wrapped up our fall concerts with the always popular Night of a Thousand Men. This performance gathers male vocal groups from elementary, middle, and high schools. They all gathered on stage to sing a finale, which was awesome to see the little guys singing next to the seniors. Winter concerts will be held on December 9th, 16th, and 18th. All concerts begin at 7.30. Come out and enjoy some great holiday music. The YEA, the Webster Young Entrepreneurs Academy, from both high schools, got a special look into the world about accounting, accounting practices for small businesses. John Bingham, a Webster graduate, and Colin Spencer presented at Webster Thomas with an interactive presentation where students could ask questions about setting up banking accounts, record keeping, and the types of business ownerships. This offered a new look into their desired field. On November 6th, Webster Thomas also hosted nearly 300 link leaders from all different high schools, some as far away as Governor. The link leaders were able to receive a refresher training to carry them through the remainder of the year. There was about 25 link advisors as well. Advisors spun off new creative ideas while comparing each other's programs. It was a very successful event. The opening night of Born Yesterday, our fall play, is happening tonight at 7.30, with other shows Friday and Saturday evening. Tickets are $6 at the door. Born Yesterday is Billy's story as she discovers that there is more to life than what she has, and that a little learning gives her control over her destiny. As Webster would call it, a growth mindset. It's a positive message that, set, that students everywhere should hear. On November 19th, Webster Thomas hosted a ceremony for the following seniors, signing their national letters of intent to play lacrosse in college. Nicole Nelson from Thomas and Claire Bolin from Schrader, both will be attending Division I Canisius College. Emily Foster from Schrader will be attending Division I St. Bonaventure University and Olivia Orsini from Webster Schrader will be attending Division II Florida Southern. We look forward to June 5th when all athletes who will play athletics in college will be announced and celebrated. After our successful fall championships, our winter sports are giving, getting underway with competitions beginning right after Thanksgiving break. We are looking forward to the exciting hockey game against Schrader on December 21st down at the ice at Frozen Frontier. Will you be one of the thousands running in the turkey trot next Thursday? Thomas students, staff, and alumni look forward to this crazy event every year. Soon, all the names of Thomas students who made the honor roll first quarter will appear in the Webster Herald. To give you some statistics, 72% of the freshman class, 70% of sophomores, 62% of juniors, and 70% of seniors made either honor roll, high honor roll, or high honor roll with distinction. Our seniors have been very busy with college applications. In fact, as of today, 174 seniors have already completed their applications, and over 640 college applications have been processed through our counseling center. They are keeping their fingers crossed to hear good news soon. This has been a great month at Webster Thomas, and we can't wait for many more. Thank you. Can I answer any questions? Just real quick, Mary, what's the time of the play Saturday night? Is it 7 or 7.30? 7.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Josh. All right. Good evening, board members, and thank you again for having me here tonight. To begin, our counseling department asked if I could pass along one of our seniors' college entrance essays with you all. All the board members were passed, sorry, emailed a copy of the essay 
In it, the student describes his experience with advanced placement courses in high school and the overall academic experience at Schrader. After reading this essay, our guidance counselors were proud to see how successful and influential AP classes to underfreshmen can be and to teach them to always strive for further academic achievement. At the last meeting, my counterpart, Lindsay, reported that our senior trip took place on the weekend of November 7th through the 11th in Baltimore and Washington, DC. Around 90 students attended and enjoyed the Inner Harbor Shops, Science Museum, National Aquarium, Baltimore Zoo, and a day in DC, which included an NBA game, the show Sheer Spectacular, and a tour of Georgetown with their <coughs> dinner dance crews on Saturday night to top off an already eventful trip. The travel agent said that the group was one of the best she has had in over 20 years, or in her own words, perfect. Over this past summer, one of our freshman English teachers, Susan Woodward, worked with Flashpoint Interactive Incorporated, an interactive website used for making classroom experience more interactive. The company implemented Ms. Woodward's Root of the Week program, which she gives students a Latin or Greek root word that they must go and search for words that contain said root. She was presented with a certificate of authorship by the company for her work. On Friday, November 15th, our accounting and advanced accounting classes attended the World of Accounting, held at, HSBC, at the HSBC building in downtown Rochester. The event was attended by over 200 students from our area, 31 from Trader. The students attended seminars and information sessions, learning about different career paths in the accounting field. The event was hosted by the New York State Society of Certified Public Accountants. This Saturday, our physics club will be sending 10 members to Buffalo State to compete in the annual Physics Olympics. We wish all participants luck in their events. In addition, the club is planning a visit to SUNY Geneseo to tour the Linear Particle Accelerator and learn about current research projects at the school. For the past three years, seniors at Trader have paired with teachers Elizabeth Gaffel and Paul Villani to raise money for Mount Hope Family Center to provide Thanksgiving meals to less fortunate families this upcoming week. This year, 10 seniors signed on to the project, headed by Abigail Muir, Megan Herbst, and Kayla Marquez. The goal for Schrader is to provide 20 baskets totaling $1,700 for families. We are very excited to say that we are very close to our goal and that many classrooms and clubs have pledged to donate baskets. And finally, this upcoming Tuesday, November 16th, Schrader will host the annual Senior Citizens Day Luncheon where senior citizens from around our community will attend musical, perform musical performances in the morning, sorry, by district groups, and then go to the cafeteria for a Thanksgiving dinner served by students provided by our food services staff. All of us at Trader hope you all have a safe and enjoyable Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I see we have Lisa and Wendy waiting in the wings. I'm sure you're gonna tell us all about the Oak Tree nomination forms. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it right over to Wendy. I'm Wendy Sardella. I'm a teacher at, here at Spry and a member of the exec board. And I'm here to talk about what these, te these great teachers have in common, and that is that they are all recipients of the Oak Tree Award. Um, starting in 2001, in a joint um, partnership between the WTA and the PTSA, we started recognizing great educators one on the elementary level and one on the secondary level each year. Um, so we're asking the community if they know a great math teacher, social studies teacher, ELA, science, ESSEL, or LOAT teacher, a guidance counselor, um, a special services instructor, PE, music, library, art, or other special teachers that are exceptional that they consider nominating them for the Oak Tree Award. Um, the Oak Tree is, is open to any teacher who, exhibit, who exhibits, let's get back there, 
who exhibits expertise in their field. They engage students. They help students um, with positive impacts in their lives. So the applications are available both on the web page for the district and at the WTA website. I've also made sure that every office, every main office has them and that they're in various newsletters. And we have a little pictorial of the recent oak tree winners. Any questions? The nomination form. You can get the nomination forms at the Webster District web page that's being put up. It should, it should be up at this point. Um, you can just search that in the search menu. It's at the WTA 1972 web page as well and in all of the main offices. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want to forget them, but I don't see any PTSA rep in the audience. Okay. Well, then we'll move on. UNICEF works in more than 190 countries to save and improve children's lives. Tonight, we have an example of the value of global citizenship, as we will hear from some students from Shalala Road Elementary School who advocated, educated, and fundraised with the hope of helping children throughout the world. So Francine and Mary Grace, would you like to introduce our, our guests? I would. I'm very happy to have Principal Leggett and Assistant Principal Chandler here, along with Alyssa Siskin and Shay Wydell, and they're going to share with us a project that they took part in at Schlegel Elementary. Good evening, everyone. So Mrs. Chandler and I are so excited to come talk with you tonight because this is one of the reasons why we went into the children's administration to celebrate students and it's an honor for us to have these two students representing a, a phenomenal project that truly was student driven so before they share with you I just want you to imagine life at Schlegel Road in the principal's office it's a bit busy isn't it Mrs. Chandler just a bit busy and so teachers come and make appointments to see Mrs. Chandler and myself and once in a while, they're able to kind of come in casually. You know, the door is open more often than not, but there's a, there can be a line at times. Well, then imagine students trying to get in and wanting to see the principal or the assistant principal and to ask a question or share a story. Well, when Mrs. Chandler and I see those students, we try to clear our path. Well, in this example that I'm sharing with you, this young lady to my right, Alyssa, she attempted, I would say, for about two and a half weeks to come in to meet and have a conversation with Mrs. Chandler and I. She would see Mrs. Chandler or she would see myself, but she couldn't get us together. Her teacher stopped in once to say, hey, Alyssa's looking to talk with you. In the end, Alyssa came to speak with us with a very small window of time to be able to do what it was that she was hoping to do. And when I had Alyssa sit down and talk with Mrs. Chandler and I and heard from her what her plans were, why she wanted to do what it is that they're about to share, I thought, you know what, this is one of those moments. This is one of the moments for my journal to capture and remember because this is what it's all about. A child being so interested in something, so persistent, not giving up, having a, an engaging conversation with her parents then going back to the classroom, going to the whole fifth grade, looking for recruit, recruits to help assist her, and Shay is one of, our, our, of the recruits, bringing them in to understand what it is to do, what it is that they, they want to share. It was so inspiring for both Mrs. Chandler and I, and without Mrs. Chandler, I don't think that this would happen because she has had many fifth graders in her office with a lot of things. So I don't want to take away Alyssa and Shay's story, but they're going to share a couple of those details. So Shay, you give it a start. got the idea for third, fourth, and fifth graders to trick or treat for UNICEF to help families who are in need of food, clean water, and a good education. We count over $1,200 for UNICEF. It felt good to help people in need and those for a good cause. Alyssa has more details to share. I'm Alyssa Ziska from Shagel. 
I'm Melissa Siskin from Schlegel. I got the idea for trick-or-treating for UNICEF from learning about human rights in ELI and social studies. When I showed my dad a homework assignment about human rights from social studies class, he showed me he told me about the trick-or-treating for UNICEF organization that he used to do when he was a kid. Then he showed me a video about it. We decided to do it for school. I talked to the principals and wrote a proposal. I formed a small group of fifth graders and we showed the third, fourth, and fifth grades what to do. We visited classes, showed a video, and explained how to use the UNICEF boxes. Then we collected all the money and counted it, and we sent a check to UNICEF. We collected over $1,200. It felt good to do it, and I got this all from learning about our human rights in school. So how's that? Pretty impressive, isn't it? Yes, it is. I enjoyed, um, after Halloween was over, hearing you know, the, the chatter in the lunchroom about, you know, Mrs. Leg and Mrs. Chandler, you should have saw in our neighborhood, we saw all these kids with UNICEF boxes. And they even talked about their neighbors that did not attend Schlegel, that they wanted to be a part of it. So it was quite a celebration that here these students are learning about human rights, a conversation probably at the dinner table, ended up turning into such a powerful moment. So I just want to celebrate and honor, and Mrs. Chandler, thank you so much for helping out with all those pennies and quarters and all that kind of stuff. A lot of fun. And thank you to Shay and to Alyssa for all that you've done to represent what it is that students can do. It's amazing, and we're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you leave, Alyssa and Shay, we have a recognition award for you and a keychain that says Imagine, Believe, and Achieve, and a Webster sticker for you. Okay, our next report, which will focus on ELA grades three through eight, uh, focuses on the board's first goal, which is ensuring that our students, all of our students, are building upon the skills, particularly reading, writing, listening, and speaking, needed as we work to be career, college, and community ready. So Mary Grace will let you introduce all of our speakers tonight. To multitask. Get the team up here. So, we are thrilled to be here tonight to share with you the phenomenal work that is going on in our classrooms in relationship to English language arts. Um, I will allow the members of my team to introduce themselves and then we'll share with you some of that work. Todd Putnam, I teach ELA 7 at Willink. Emily Verhow, I teach ELA 8 at Spry. Jen Bois, I'm a consultant teacher at Clem North. Pam Smith, I'm a third grade teacher at Clem North. So we are here tonight to share with you that as educators, we constantly strive to prepare our students for the real world that they will be living in. We want that to be sure to help them acquire the tools they need to be successful in their futures. So how do we know that we are giving them the correct tools? If you look up at the slide, I'm sure that a few of you recognize some of those tools. But the truth of the matter is that many of our third through eighth graders might not. Innovation and change are coming at a tremendously fast pace. And that is why it is more critical than ever to help students acquire skills that will serve them well in an undefined future. We rely on research and feedback from colleges, businesses, economists, and other stakeholders to help define the skills that will best serve our current students. As you can see from some of these samples, the skill sets required of people entering the workforce are changing. You can also see 
Webster's own voice in this work from the focus groups that the community participated in on college and career readiness. Skills like critical thinking, problem solving, when you talk about creativity, that is creative thinking and high level thinking and that's what the types of skills we're trying to help our students achieve. This research has led to the creation of specific standards that help define the skills students need so they have access to opportunities and their best futures in college, career, and as productive citizens. So what are the learning standards? We use the College and Career Readiness Anchor Standards to define the graduate level skills that students need for their futures. Grade level specific Common Core Learning Standards help us know incrementally what building towards these goals looks like at each grade level. And Mary Grace is about to show you a uh, anchor standard for reading. That's an example of a college and career readiness anchor standard. And it says, uh, read closely to determine what the text says explicitly and to make logical inferences from it. Cite specific textual evidence when writing or speaking to support conclusions drawn from the text. And again, this is the graduate level of this particular anchor standard. These standards are then looked at holistically and back mapped appropriately so that each grade level plays a part in helping students meet the graduation expectation. Here's how College and Career Readiness Reading Standard 1 looks specifically at third and seventh grades. For third grade, ask and answer questions to demonstrate understanding of a text, refer explicitly to text for basis of answers. And at seventh grade, cite several pieces of textual evidence to support analysis of what a text says explicitly and when drawing inferences. We will be looking more at these two grade levels during the rest of this report. So our teachers use many resources to help support students in their skill acquisition. There are some new terms being used out there, for example, the word module. This is really no different than the teacher editions of textbooks that most of us are familiar with. Teacher editions of textbooks contain text and suggestions for instructional practice, questions teachers might ask, or activities that they might try with their students. Modules are very similar to this. Today, as in the past, teachers make decisions about how to use these resources to build units for their classroom. Students need access to a wide variety of materials, instructional practices, genres, and instructional goals in order to be ready for their futures. We are dedicated to providing them with a balanced educational experience. In Webster, this balance is enhanced by our belief that cross-curricular instruction plus teacher voice equals great results and excitement for learning for our students. In our journey as a district with the Common Core Learning Standards for ELA, we have worked very hard to identify the most powerful teaching and learning strategies and resources that we will utilize consistently across our district. At grades three, four, and five, we have brought greater coherence to the utilization of these dynamic resources by weaving them into frames of teaching and learning across our year. These frames thoughtfully weave elements of each of the resources so that learners make powerful connections throughout their school day. Content in science and social studies is also meaningfully connected to this ELA instruction to maximize the potential for our learners to transfer the skills and knowledge that they learn into multiple disciplines and multiple aspects of their lives. On the screen is one example of this for third grade. And you'll hear from Jen and Pam about how the inter integration of these elements has really come to life in their third grade classroom. Our integrated frames were not created overnight, and nor is our work on them complete. What we know about quality professional learning for teachers is that it doesn't occur just in one-time isolated workshops or singular trainings. Instead, the most powerful learning for our teachers occurs when the learning is sustained over time when it's embedded in their daily work, and when it happens in the company of colleagues. Our liter literacy integration cadre of teacher leaders meets approximately once a month to continue the work on the refinement of these frames, 
in response to our experiences in our classrooms. We also have several Polycom video conferencing conversations planned throughout this school year that will allow all teachers from the same grade level at different buildings to collaborate. We have several superintendent conference days and grade level release days planned, and those are also dedicated to the continuation of this important work. Our common resources and curricular choices are allowing us to function in the larger district-wide sense as grade level PLCs. We've had some truly powerful district-wide teacher collaborations occur as a direct result of this work. As the work unfolds, we're finding that we're truly living Webster's core beliefs through this curriculum work. Some good examples of this. Students first. We have often reflected, as we have tonight, that the reason we engage in this work is because we are preparing our students for their futures. Their futures, as we know, are different from our own pasts. Our teachers and our administrators in Webster are deeply committed to continuous improvement. And this year has been all about risk-taking and perseverance for our teaching teams. They're learning new ways of teaching and they're committed to improving their practice. Collaboration. The level of collaboration in the Webster School District is truly unmatched. Our teachers working together with our administrators and instructional team are the true leaders in this work. It has truly been a wonderful experience. We're sharing a mic here, give us a second. Um, to work alongside teachers in this work. And uh, this is a celebration of the, the work that we've done, but I don't want to diminish the fact that this is difficult work. And teachers are showing extreme amounts of perseverance and problem solving and working together um, to create these frames for our students. So what does this look like when it's translated into the classroom, which is the most important thing? Let's take a look at a typical third grade classroom experience, and then we'll move on to seventh grade. We believe that cross-curricular instruction plus teacher voice equals great results and excitement for learning for our students. Our first cross-curricular unit was entitled My Librarian is a Camel. This was a very powerful unit for our students, and their learning was certainly enriched. They gained a deep understanding of different cultures, student collaboration, how to effectively communicate, as well as thinking and reasoning skills. This unit was started in September, and it became very clear as we began this unit that our students had very little understanding that life outside of Webster would be any different than what they knew. It became a priority of ours to be sure that they would have an understanding of the diversity of lives around our world. The resources that we selected to use helped to bring home this point as they were rich in language and had beautiful illustrations that drew the children in and helped increase their desire to learn about other world cultures. At this time, we would like to share lesson eight, our final lesson in this unit. Each child read about a different country and how they accessed books using the nonfiction text, My Librarian is a Camel. They became the expert on that country. In order to do this, they captured the gist and answered text-dependent questions on their own using evidence from their reading. Evidence of depth and rigor were very apparent through the students using their text to do multiple close reads, finding support for specific questions, as well as being able to tell the main idea of their selection with little support from us. Keep in mind, this was all in September. Next, they were asked to think about in what country would it be hardest to access books? And why is it hard for people in your country to access books? Students prepared a statement on their own using their evidence gathered during their close reads stating why it was hard for people in the country they studied to access books. They provided evidence to support their opinion. We then asked them to practice reading their statements so their opinions would be clearly understood by their peers prior to joining their discussion group. Students were then gathered in heterogeneous groups to share their statements about why their country had the most difficult time accessing books. The students were engaged in thoughtful discussion throughout the entire process. Their conversations were on topic and respectful of one another. 
At the end, we posed a question to the students asking them if their opinion changed after hearing other information from their peers. It was great to see that some of their opinions did change based on evidence from what other students reported. A great moment occurred for us when a group of students took it upon themselves to use a world map to help strengthen their evidence. This was unprompted, and we could see that it was helping them learn more about their country through looking at the location in relation to their peers' country. They began to discuss further the physical features that were obstacles for people in their country. The final product of this unit was a bookmark project that linked ELA and content even further. Each child wrote a summary paragraph describing their country's librarian and what that person, animal, or organization had to go through to get books to those people. These bookmarks show a deep understanding of that country's culture, geography, and people. And I, I'm just going to interrupt quickly to let you know that this is raw footage, um, mm -hmm. that this was really an exciting moment, and the teacher ran to get her camera because the students just gravitated toward the map and started talking about their countries and the deep learning that they had around um, what people in those countries experienced on a daily basis. So I just wanted to point out that that wasn't staged. It was <laughs> live. <laughs> In September, we made a conscious decision to focus on the speaking and listening standards in these cross-curricular lessons, as well as responding to questions using text-based evidence, rather than putting a strong focus on formalized writing. As the fall has progressed, our students have grown already, and at this point in our second unit of study, they are now writing informational pieces to showcase their learning, rather than just you having those good, deep conversations. They are using text-based evidence in their writing. They are being immersed in nonfiction and learning how to read to learn now. Bullfrog at Magnolia Circle was a central text used for multiple lessons in the beginning of Unit 2. The lesson we'd like to share, Lesson 11, was incredibly re rewarding to us as educators. We were able to see such tremendous growth both in the students' writing skills as well as in their ability to read and gain knowledge from text with increased independence. Bullfrog at Magnolia Circle was our main text in the first part of this unit. The children were engaged in multiple close reads of various sections of this text. The focus of each read was for a unique purpose. Children real realized that they were reading with a new purpose each time. They were reading for evidence of adaptations, habitat, and life cycle. Here is an example of a finished informational piece that was used as a mid-unit assessment. The students were asked to take their learning from the text and write a paragraph telling how a bullfrog survives. An adaptation we made as teachers to this task was to retype the writing page to make it more student-friendly, as well as have the students write a checklist that was taught to them in writing workshop that reminds them of the necessary parts of a paragraph. We were very impressed with the quality of the writing as well as the depth of science knowledge that they were able to show in their writing. In the past, at this point in the year, this quality of writing had not always been evident by third graders. The connectivity between our writer's workshop and this current unit of study is seamless. The children are writing their own informational texts right now about topics that they believe they are experts on. They have been engaged, excited, and motivated throughout this unit. Mentor texts have been pivotal in helping to further their writing skills. They are using nonfiction texts and guided reading as well as in our cross-curricular unit. Whenever possible, we are making conscious connections for them to see the various parts of informational text and how they can use these in their own writing. Moving to the middle level. At the middle level, we continue to grow students' knowledge base by interacting with fiction and nonfiction texts. The focus is on instruction that encourages students to build their understanding of concepts, think critically, and communicate in more complex ways. Uh, this seventh grade unit was an examination of polar exploration. It was primarily a series of excerpts from the writings of the most well-known explorers, uh, though it also included an excerpt from Jack London's classic short story, To Build a Fire. All of the texts were clearly written with a primarily educated adult audience in mind, 
which made it challenging reading for our students. The excerpts were all designed to be closely read several times with attention paid to various aspects of reading comprehension such as word choice and usage, vocabulary acquisition, the value of text features, and annotation. Kids also discovered that the word text refers to any source of information, including photographs, websites, and videos. We felt that the unit was well designed and that it started with a pair of photo collages of two of the polar explorers. And by carefully looking at those pictures, kids created a set of questions um, that we hopefully were able to answer with the rest of the text that followed in the unit. It set up an anticipation. It gave them a reason to want to keep reading. The nature of the activities ensured that small group and whole class discussions, as well as individual writing, remained purely rooted in the texts. While this was an excellent unit with many great strategies, it was really not a huge departure from what we've been doing in our classrooms over the past couple of years as the state standards have been rolled out. Close reading for details is a skill that students will use for a lifetime. Reading closely and the recognition of important details is the first step in being able to use text as a resource for building knowledge, writing, or having text-based discussions. Teachers help students focus their thinking by using guiding questions to frame the close reading and by facilitating discussions that reference text details. Scaffolding and differentiation are also essential to all quality instruction. Teachers are making instructional decisions to scaffold the tasks when needed. For example, we may pre-teach vocabulary, read text aloud, and pull out difficult sections of the text to examine more closely with students. Our higher level learners feel challenged in tackling the text, reading closely, and annotating and analyzing the author's language. A combination of the challenging text compared with the high quality teaching is leading to challenging and engaged learning for all students. You can see up on the screen a, uh, the culminating essay of the Polar Exploration Close Reading Unit. This was written by one of our students who typically has struggled with writing, uh, but you can see that the essay is well organized. It includes text and line number citations, demonstrating that his claim is indeed being supported by specific text-based details taken from several passages. And at least for the purposes of this essay, the student, quote, found learning about the problems, conditions, and difficulties that Arctic explorers had to go through very interesting. And I'm taking that right out of his text. <laughs> so as these snapshots of the work our students are doing in the LA classrooms illustrate, we continue to use the Common Core learning standards to build our students' skills so that they are ready for their futures. Thank you. Whatever, whatever that may be. And if you happen to be on Twitter, you can follow some of this work uh, with the hashtag WCSD frames and Webster Proud. Um, there will be examples of pictures of students' work and teachers' collaboration posted to those. So, as you can see, I hope, we are extremely proud of the work that we've been doing. As I've said, it's intense work, it's difficult work, but we know it's the right work. And I thought it was so interesting when we were practicing tonight, both Todd and Emily said, we can't wait to get these, these students that are coming up. Look what third graders are doing. And time and time again, we've heard um, from teachers, from parents, how impressed they are with what students are achieving. And um, we're looking forward to our next steps. That is our presentation. Thanks. Great job. I think we'll start with Janine. Do you have any questions? I do. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, but there is some concern over the pace with which Common Core is being implemented. What are the challenges that the district has or continues to experience resulting from that pace? Because that's one of the things that we tend to hear a lot about. Um, so what are the experiences that you've seen with that in terms of the pace at which uh, Common Core is being implemented? I can, I can start and then feel free if you have things to add. Um, I think one of the things that's important to emphasize when we, when we talk about the implementation of Common Core um, is that this process really started for us here in Webster three years ago. 
And during that first year, we spent a great deal of time at our faculty meetings, lead teacher curriculum meetings, talking about those instructional shifts that we would be, we would be bringing to the forefront over the next couple of years. Um, at the elementary level, last year I know that you've heard a lot about how we really dove into the math and implemented across our district um, some changes to our math curriculum. And you know that work continues this year with our ELA work and it's very focused work that continues. And I think the challenge for us continues to be having that really focused time to collaborate with our teachers because once we are together, you know, things really great things are happening. Um, and you know, is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, I, I think maybe it's a, a conception because it's all of a sudden being covered in the news. I think the deal is we're actually ahead of a lot of other places. I was just writing that down. Yeah. That's what it's. <laughs> um, I, I really do think we are. I think we've been. Uh, as Kate said, we've, we've, we've been talking about the shifts and working on the shifts for three years now. And, um, and as I said before, the, the units that are coming out are not much different from what we've been doing over the past few years. So I, I think we're at an advantage. It might not look like that in the public eye because of what Channel 10 is showing or ABC because a lot of other uh, districts are just coming into this. I, that, that's my impression anyway. Thank you. I do have another. Okay. Um, do you think there are structural changes either with resources or timing or testing that you believe should be changed in the implementation that would have a significance on the impact either in terms of the way the students are learning or the teachers are instructing? So it, modules, testing, timing kinds of things that your experience is? As we are moving forward in this work, we are very thoughtful and reflective about it and we are making it our own work. And so um, we are taking the time, we are revisiting, we are revising, we are making sure that our, we are putting our students first. And, and when we put something into effect, we are, are gauging how it is working, how our students are achieving, and we are making thoughtful decisions uh, based on that. So we're constantly reflecting and changing and adapting what we have the power to change and adapt here. And um, being true to our vision of what we want our students to be participating in on a daily basis. Does anybody want to add to that? I think. Um, I think one of the, if, if you remember the slide where we had the frames, uh, the actual pictures of the frames of how um, we as literacy cadre members looked at how can we make sure we have a really good um, cross-curricular approach to everything. And there, there was a really, a lot of time and thought that was put into developing the frames that we could use at the elementary level. And um, Kate and Melissa were at the forefront of that for us. And, um, it's been very helpful for us in the classroom to be able to have such a connection between science and social studies and writing workshop and our guided reading as well as these new units that are coming out from the state which for us are a, just a tool for us to be able to make sure that we're hitting standards um, through a really embedded approach which is much more powerful and meaningful for kids. They're making connections that they didn't make before. They're able to um, really understand what we're trying to get them to understand rather than being inundated with vocabulary and dates and times. Like It's really more about the process of learning. It's more about um, deep understanding versus um, you know, some, of, some of the rote memory that we used to do. It, it's different, definitely, but it's, it's much more rich and engaging for them. And they, I think because everything is interconnected, it's more powerful for them. Yes, um, first of all, I think these lessons are great. I really think it's really helpful for, for kids who might be not as organized as other kids or not as spontaneous in writing. I mean, you map it all out, you think about what they're going to include, you organize it, and I, th I assume all those little pieces of paper were organizing their thoughts, and then writing it. I think that's, that's great. It really gets to the needs of all students. Um, the one thing that we have been hearing um, is about creativity. So can you give me an example of where, or, or tell me along the way, will the kids have opportunities to do some creative writing on topics maybe that they might be interested in and, or also pick, um, pick the topics or pick the books that they're going to be using? Um, I'll, I'm definitely going to uh, let the teachers speak to this because I'm sure they can give you great examples, but I want to remind you that we still are um, engaged in um, writer's workshop, and so there are multiple opportunities within our writer's workshop model for students to write creatively. Um, 
but I'll let the teachers speak to this a little bit. Yeah, the children are uh, participating in a writer's workshop as well as a variety. I mean, they don't, it all blends in kind of throughout mm -hmm. the day, but we did a narrative unit at the beginning because um, kids write best about what they know mm -hmm. and they chose the topics that they were going to write about. They also have a writer's notebook and we keep, um, that's something throughout the um, district that we have started and they have a note, notebook that they respond in every morning and that they okay. can creatively, Good. I have kids writing chapters, I have kids, they're like little authors <laughs> and um, then we also are doing an informational writing but what's really neat is that we're reading about informational text but then they're actually using the text that we're teaching from and as their mentor text kind of and they're taking those concepts and they're writing their own informational piece and they are structuring it based on the topic that they want to write about right. and then they're organizing their story, how they want to organize it. And it's just really cool seeing how Good. they're setting up their table of contents and are they going to put a diagram in or you know, um, a comparison chart or something like that. So it's just very Great. interesting. Yeah, Great. I just wanted to highlight back to one of the slides that we showed earlier where the, the children were writing their informational text about the bullfrog, but then on the other side is the is the uh, choice-based piece that this child chose to write about kinds of scooters, lots of different kinds of scooters, right. the razor, the grit, and you know, really getting their their own ch choice involved in uh, how they were going to use that same kind of genre writing that they were learning across the day. Right. Just I want to add one more thing. Really sure. Quick. I think it's really important to note that. Um, the learning that we're doing is sparking creativity. We were just mm -hmm. talking about um, a student who went home and did research on her own about poison dart frogs and found a video clip to share with the class on National Geographic Kids that, that was detailing exactly what we had learned about um, in the lesson. It, so it's, it's encouraging them to go and seek out more information on their own. We have students writing their own informational texts at home, publishing them, bringing them in, sharing them with the class in addition to what we're already writing right. in class. So it's for me, it's actually um, having them produce more than they ever have, and they're getting lots of opportunities to be creative in their own ways. Great. And also, really Great. engaging nonfiction writing should be creative, too, and that's something we, I know in seventh grade, is something we stress. Even with the introduction to an expository uh, paper, we'll say, start out with an anecdote of some sort that leads mm -hmm. in. So it's not writing a short story, per se, but it's still using creativity to make right. their own, whatever type of writing that they're doing more engaging. Right. Great, thank you very much. That's it? Yes. Thank you. Tom, anything? Uh, just real quick, a great report. Um, you can see the energy in it, and I appreciate that. Um, one thing I was wondering, what about the spectrum of students and their learning capability? You, know, you talked about what they were going through and, and moving them along, but if you find someone struggling, or if you find that student that really picked up on it and seems to be way ahead, how do we handle those situations when you're moving your students through this type of application? Well, uh, as far as this unit went, there were a large number of excerpts, and we didn't get to every single one with everybody. But that was a good place where, you know, student A is done great, doing a great job. Here, why don't you, why don't you tackle this for me? Let me know what you think. Um, and for, for kids who struggled more, there were a bunch of scaffolding uh, type of activities that we could do. We would read, aloud, read it aloud first with them, go over vocabulary first to, um, to help them with this. Because again, really for most of the kids, there was some difficulty with these because they were written in early 1900 language, as I said, for, you know, written for an adult audience. You know, so um, there was a lot of vocabulary that we needed to cover beforehand for most of the kids. But um, for some kids, we did that more. For other kids, we did that less, and as I said, for some, we had the opportunity to say, why don't you read this other excerpt from the same explorer and see, see what you think about it. Great. Thank you. We, I, I believe that there's a lot of room for differentiation within, within these units. Um, we have a wide variety of reading levels in our classroom, and um, some of the texts are available in audio form, and if they're not, we read them into an iPod and have them listen uh, 
um, to it while the students are reading on their own. Um, the other nature of these lessons is that they're doing multiple reads and almost always the first time through we're reading it to them so they're getting the flow of the piece and they're hearing the good fluency and intonation and, and just getting time to enjoy it and then the other times that they read they're reading on their own or with a partner or maybe we'll pull a small group. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is because it is interconnected and within a framework of literacy we have lots of opportunities through the guided reading groups as well as intervention times. Um, I'm an interventionist so when I pull um, groups of students I make sure I know what's being targeted in the classroom and then I do more of that in my time with the children as well so they're it's it's never leaving them they're always practicing what we want them to be practicing in multiple settings and they'll even say hey I just did that with Mrs. Dubois or I just did that in reading group with Mrs. Smith like they don't really realize what we're doing but there's lots of opportunities for them to have scaffolding and practice um, within these units thank you and Tom I'm just going to quickly respond to that a little bit too because one of the things that I'm noticing um, that has been just wonderful to see are students who might not be able to independently read complex text on their own engaged in the conversations with their peers because they've they've had access to that text via other means and so they um, are having conversations at a very high level um, compared to things I've seen in the past when they were limited maybe to the text that they were interacting with because of their reading level. Thank you, Tom. Fritz? Just a, a comment and then a, a question. Todd, I, I thought your comment about how long the, the, the instruction has been happening in Webster was, was pretty telling because it is in the media and it's on Twitter. <laughs> which you which uh, which you pointed out that Webster has a Twitter account. So when people read this and the social media, and it's coming at you so so quickly. I, I thought it was pretty telling to listen to your presentation and, and your comment that this has been going on for quite some time. It's we're we're, we're already doing it. <clears throat> My question is, if you could talk to the board about. In your daily practice, how are you doing this work, but also very efficiently or the best that you can bring in, bring in other curriculum areas? I heard cross-disciplinary um, lessons, learning occurring, but how, how do you do that on a daily basis, if, if you could just touch upon that very briefly? Um, well, it happens seamlessly just with, with our first unit. It was all, it was primarily the social studies connection was there. But as we were sitting here right before the board meeting, we were having some in-depth conversations with how we could incorporate science into that unit as well, seeing as how we're talking about other world cultures and, and taking the, um, the standpoint of, which is really um, able to be understood by kids of how do they get books. You know, we can go down to our library, but other, other places they can't do that. So it was able to be understandable for them. Um, we talked about landforms. We talked about, you know, physical features. We also talked about weather and climate. So that could be another avenue for science to be integrated into the social studies. And next year we would, you know, look for ways that we could do that. Um, in our current unit, it's very science related. So um, in addition to reading about you know, frogs and learning about animal adaptations. Um, we're also um, going to be having live frogs in the classroom and eggs and tadpoles and hatching them and watching the life cycle of all of that. And upcoming units we have um, where we're going to be talking about um, wolves and um, the fables, fables and um, making, again, social studies and science connections. And we're going to be wrapping up the year with um, simple machines and forces of of um, motion and all of those things, it, the kids don't realize we don't call it science time or social studies time anymore. It's we don't even really call it anything. It's just kind of we're, we're reading, you know, and and we're and we're learning. They don't know the difference between any of yeah. it, which I think I, is important. Yeah, I thought it was really great when Alyssa and Shay were up here, and she said we learned about this in social studies, and it really was there. It was the ELA text that they were referencing, and so I just think that all of that um, integration really helps bring home the learning for our students. Thanks. How you guys doing? Good. <laughs> you know what I really liked actually as I was listening and watching the presentation was I don't think there was any mention of ELA testing 
or any kind of scores or results. So it's kind of nice to see ELA or reading and writing cross screen just kind of happen. And that knowing the teachers and everything, that's kind of what happens. So thank you very much for taking away from the numbers a little bit, which is good to see. Then in the meantime, I had a, this is more of a thought or a comment, and that is, and maybe Mr. Putnam, he's probably been around a little bit long enough to be able to do this. Um, but the, oh, so thank you. <laughs> That's a, that's a good veteran, right? Um, just a thought, you know, somebody mentioned Crosswalk, I think in a workshop we are at recently. It'd be neat to pull up a, a paper from 2003 or 1997 and to say, this is what we were doing in 1997 or 2003. I know my mom has them, but they're a little bit older. And this is what we're doing now in 2013. And just to see the level and the depth and the cross, more cross trigger possibly that's in there, just for everybody to kind of see this is what we're now doing with the Common Core, just a thought or suggestion, because you might want to come back and present again. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> when he's younger? Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you. <laughs> I want to say this is very refreshing to see the passion and the excitement out of this group. I really mean it. You know, you start hearing the negatives, and you see it on TV, and you hear it from parents and some teachers and stuff, but. This was very refreshing, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, we do hear the concerns from parents and even teachers. And uh, one of the questions I have is, is that we have lead teachers. What kind of role or what, what role do they play as far as helping every day some of the teachers that are kind of frustrated and, and uh, putting together their, you know, the lesson plan and stuff? Uh, I, I don't understand exactly the role they play every day for those teachers. Um, how big is it? Uh, how t do you meet a lot? Uh, you know, do you find this in your own daily activities that lead teachers are meeting with other teachers a lot? How does that work? I, for, for me, being a lead teacher, I, I would say my role is pretty, um, I don't want to say casual, but it, it's more of a we're all in this together type deal because I am doing exactly the same lessons that, that everybody else is doing. Um, and so I, I think my role best is sometimes just listen, say, okay, and uh, you know, say, well, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I know other people are doing. Um, so it's kind of a kind of a that type of thing. In my PLC, I'm just another member of the PLC, and then, you know, because the, the people are there, all working really hard. Um, but as far as my role as a lead teacher and facilitating this kind of shift, I'm just you know doing what I can to provide information, and uh, and and if somebody's hot about something, to just talk about what's going on and see what you we become can do a cheerleader. About. What's that? Are you a cheerleader? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> Bring back positive. Yeah. Um, oh, I could add to that a little bit too. From the elementary perspective, the lead teachers meet once a month as a district-wide group, and one of the um, effects of that is that that consistency that we spoke about earlier as well is really enhanced because those teachers have an experience that they're then able to bring back and help lead in their faculty meetings within their building and they have that same message that's coming across across all seven of those buildings and it really helps to build that that district-wide PLC look that we're really we're really starting to have. Cool. Do you guys feel like you're on an upswing over last year as far as uh, ELA? Yes. Yeah. I. I Last year was tough for everybody with the with the changes in APPR and everything, and there were just some things that we had to do that, you know, we we didn't feel were totally educationally as, as sound as we'd like them to be, um, and we we've been free of that this year, and I think yeah, especially in that in that respect, yes. We've Good. been able to focus more on instruction, I think. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and when you the, yeah, I'm sorry, but when you talk about reflecting and responding and listening to our teachers and. There's an excellent example of it right there. Um, the, the resources that we're, that we're using, the module, um, just, you know, it's another tool for us, but I feel like it's really given us a good direction on the kind of rigor and the kind of um, questions we should be asking for the kids and the kind of thinking that, that we need to be stretching them to. It, it's really helped give us a better and stronger direction about where we want them to go. And we know that the, that the tests are out there, but that's not something that we think about every day because we know we're doing good teaching every day. And if we're doing good, solid, strong instruction, the results will come. Good. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Mike. If you would, one of the concerns we've heard is about the emphasis of nonfiction. Could you reaffirm for us 
that literature is being done in ELA? Yeah, I, I, what I see is just in the past, I don't, even before the Common Core, uh, a much higher emphasis on reading in general. Um, and so while we are doing much more nonfiction, it doesn't mean we've dropped the literature to do it. We're, we're, we're finding that balance. We're trying to find the balance. Um, I know we're, we're doing short stories, we're doing poetry, we're doing novels. Um, we have, in, the, in several of the grade levels at Willink anyway, we've got the free reading program where kids are reading. Uh, the goal is to read 20 books a year, and those are books that they themselves choose, um, and that most of those are nonfiction. Um, so I, we're, we're looking for the balance. It's a good question. I know at third grade, we could, I could speak on that. We had a blend in our first unit of both nonfiction and fiction, but covering the same topic. And it also um, kind of paralleled as well in our frog unit now, we're um, exposing them to different poetry uh, mm -hmm. about different frogs. And then we're paralleling it with a nonfiction piece as well. And then also um, as a teacher, choosing what text is appropriate for what my guided reading group needs. And um, I'm able to provide a balance with the books that I choose in my guided reading groups. Thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation and thank you for answering our questions. Wait, watch out, Pam was one of my students. <laughs> <laughs> she better know how to read. Oh, well. <laughs> At least it wasn't the third Leroy. Know the difference. Was it Leroy? <laughs> Who was it from? Leo from Leroy <laughs> or whatever. Oh, no, Leonard. <laughs> oh Leonard, Leonard, Leonard from Leonard. Leroy, whatever it was. Um, board members, this does require action, so may we have a motion to accept the ELA report, please. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much for a very nice Thank report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this point, we hear from our superintendent. So, Adele, your yeah, report. I do want to start tonight by talking about more teaching, less testing, and maximizing teacher voice. And talk about last spring. Um, we had many parents come to the office and they were providing us with constructive criticism about what their children were experiencing in relative to testing. Because of the APPR um, and the plan that we had created, students were taking a lot of tests last year. We heard this from parents, we heard this from teachers, we heard this from students. And the new system was, the new APPR system is based on two different strands of testing. Each is worth 20%. So we had added more pre and post tests um, to what students were experiencing and what teachers were having to do in the classroom to meet the requirements of the APPR. And I have to say it was an unhappy year. Students were spending too much time taking tests. They weren't used to the impact in classroom instruction. Teachers were losing that valuable time. And the coordination and scoring and reporting of all those tests was a logistical and time challenge, to say the least. It took out hours and hours and hours of time. So after listening and reflecting in depth on, on what our parents had told us, what we heard from our kids, the stress we saw in our kids, and what our teachers shared with us, we really had to talk, um, had to have some frank conversations with the Webster's Teachers Association and say, can we try something different? Can we try a new way? And I do want to give a lot of credit to the WTA for working with us and understanding that these were challenges and having the courage to say, we need to try something different. And I also want to give a lot of credit to Mr. Gamina for um, his creative thinking <laughs> because he really came up with a good scenario that that he proposed to us that we felt could really work and, and everyone bought into this plan. So we developed a different kind of plan um, and our plan uses historical data from tests the students have already been taking. So teachers could look at this data, prepare for them, project growth for their students and not lose instructional time and not add more tests. So students could go back to tests they were familiar with and they could have more of their teachers focus and attention for instruction. And I think you heard some of the teachers say today, but I want to say it again, that we're a happier district because of this change. And we do appreciate the voices that came to us with constructive criticism and said, there's something going on and it's not, it's not good for our kids, it's not good for the classroom instruction. 
um, and they guided us to take action. But I have to say the change was hard, and it required multiple hours working with the state. Um, again and again and again. We would propose a plan, get feedback, propose a tweak to the plan, get some more feedback. Hours and hours working with them in order to get this plan approved. Um, so I am going tomorrow to Albany. In fact, I'm driving tonight after the board meeting and we're meeting with the commissioner um, to tell him personally that this has to become easier. Um, I want to see more of what we saw tonight. I want to see teachers excited about instruction in the classroom. We all want to see that. We want to see less stress, less testing that students don't understand to fulfill the requirements of a teacher evaluation system because it's just disconnected. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight and tomorrow um, and trying to make our voices heard on behalf of the work that this district has done. So, you know, I think that we are trying to maximize our teachers' voices. As, we, as you heard them speak tonight, the pace of the transition, and I know, Mike, you, you asked that question, what has the pace been like? Um, it's been difficult, the pace of it, because everything was required at once. And yes, we did start the shifts earlier, three years ago. Everything was added last year, though, at once. It all came to roost, so, so to speak, in one year. So um, it's been difficult for all educators. And you know we are hearing that and seeing that in the way people are talking about the, but they're lumping it all together with the core as one word and not not separating what is really at the heart of the matter and i believe it's the testing it's over testing so the instructional part is what we tried to highlight for you tonight um, and the, the voices of our teachers um, were true to what they've been doing in the classroom. We have worked very hard to give them time, and that is, that's another thing that is hard to find sometimes when you're in the middle of teaching, um, but we've been able to use some technology so teachers can talk to each other while they're in their buildings. They can talk to teachers in other buildings. We've been able to use all of the time that we per presently have and repurpose it to these things so that our teachers are having time to talk and spend and think and teach. Um, so that's our focus this year, and I just wanted to make those comments sort of in summation to the report that you heard tonight. I also wanted to now just give some good reports from the schools. I want to recognize our middle schools and celebrate students who exemplify the care attributes through all 11 schools, uh, cooperation, accountability, respect, and excellence. So each month, Willink Middle School celebrates Titans Who Care to Make a Difference, and Spry Middle School, the program is called Spry Care, Students of the Month. So staff at each middle school select students who exemplify the district's care motto in the classroom and in their everyday lives. And these students perform random acts of kindness, contribute significantly, significantly to their school and community, and have a positive influence on their friends and are overall good role models. Both awards are collaborative efforts of the Webster Central School District, the PTSA, and the Webster Health and Education Network. So I salute the students who make a caring attitude part of their everyday lives and you'll be seeing those students in reports very soon. And building on that motto of care and action at all of our schools, I want to recognize our students in the many ways they celebrated the community's veterans for Veterans Day last week. So for example, Spry Middle School Student Council and the Webster Fairport Elks hosted a complimentary dinner for Webster area veterans. The collaboration for this event is really phenomenal. 70 Spry, 70 Spry students and staff work together to serve over 200 meals to our veterans and their guests. So we thank them for their hard work and for Hagedorn's and the Holt Road Wegmans store for their generous donation to this annual event. And I have to say, um, I think we have some pics that we can put up from this, do we, to show? And uh, I was walking out of my office while this event was going on and the Spry this, this spry cafeteria was just mobbed with people. And then I remembered, oh yeah, it's the, it's the veterans event. It was really amazing. Um, and having the dinner served and the intergenerational aspect of this, very, very powerful. Fifth grade students at Clem South also got to welcome a panel of veteran, Vietnam veterans to ask them questions and learn about their service to our country. A similar panel of veterans representing most of the modern day conflict shared life lessons with Spry's seventh graders. So just a few examples of our students learning rich history lessons from our community's veterans. And I have two things, two other announcements tonight. I want to ask uh, just a reminder to our community, if you're listening tonight and you have not filled out our district strategic planning survey, we want your voice. We are showing you our website. And um, you may complete the community engagement survey online uh, until Monday, November 25th. WebsterSchools.org is our website. 
Your feedback will be used by the board and the district as we continually plan for the futures of our 11 schools. So we really want your voice. We've got over 1,200 responses so far. It's a great participation, um, but we'd like to encourage you to go on that website and uh, give us your feedback. And then one last thing, um, there was some talk about special ed this evening, and I did want to just show, we, we have a meeting on Monday, November 25th, for special education parents and teachers. And we do want to encourage um, parents to come out. This is where you can find other parents for support. I know, having parented a special ed child myself, that nobody really understands you like another special ed parent um, because the challenges are so unique. So having a place where you can share with other parents and get support from our teachers and from our administrators is a true partnership. So I really would encourage people to come out on November 25th um, to the Spy Auditorium for this, what we call SEPTA, Special Education Parent and Teacher Association meeting. And that ends my report. Thank you, Adele. I have a quick question, Adele. How many responses do we get from the last uh, survey that we did two years ago? Yeah, or in general. Uh, we are up. I'm trying to remember. Barb is there. Oh, she's got it. Um, With 995 last time, and we have 1,200 so far, and we still have five more days, yes. four more days. Okay, That's great. a record. Yep, Same with um, teaching staff. We were at 58% um, oh, last time. We're up to 71%. So we're, we're, we're getting a better engagement with our survey. Good. good Very good, good. good. Well, thank you, Adele, for that report. We'll move on to our school liaison reports. Mike, do you have anything from any, from, you're at Plank North, right? Yep. Yep. Um, no. Okay, thank you, Paul. <laughs> uh, teacher conferences next three days, right? Yep. I know it's at Clem South, and their winter concert is December 12th. Parent teacher conference, I think. Back to you. Come back to me? Yep. Um, one thing I want to say is, is I wish we had more participation uh, at that, that level at the PTSA. Um, you know, it seems like it's the same parents that care. Um, you know, parents need to get more involved with uh, uh, the PTSA. It's a great organization. You can really come away with, uh, you know, getting some questions answered uh, if you have any. And it's a great way to keep track of uh, what your child's doing. But I'd love to see more participation. We got a great group. Uh, uh, the ladies do a phenomenal job. Absolutely. And so does uh, Principal Peter and uh, Heather, David Peter and, and uh, Heather Balsamo. They're awesome at Plank North, and uh, we appreciate them being there. It just doesn't have to be ladies. Well, it could be them. It can be men. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> oh, I'm getting what, what, you just keep slapped them? right here, boy. <laughs> no, go to Fritz. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Tom? Janine? Um, well, you heard from Schlegel Road tonight, so I was very proud of Schlegel Road and the students there. Um, the next event we have at school is PTSA Holiday Celebration, which is Tuesday, December 10th at 7 p.m. And I'm not, I'm not sure what that means, so we'll have to go on the website and find out. So, okay. Thank you. The annual winter concert for Plank South is Monday, December 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, tonight, the uh, student parent dinner and art night was held here at Spry. Uh, the parents and children and students, I won't say children, the students were working on making a family tree project and it was really kind of neat to see what they were doing. There's also a Lego robotic competition this Saturday at Spry and we have local teams from both Spry and Willink will be participating. And I believe, yes, they're going to be in it also? Okay. Yep. That's right. That's Plank right. North is well represented and they're going to take it all. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> David's here. He's going to have to take care of that. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I see those. Well, they, they wouldn't compete against Will Lincoln Spry, I don't believe. No. no. no that's good. Okay. We move on to our Monroe County School Board Association report. Sue, do you have anything from steering? Uh, meeting, next meeting, January 15th. That was quick. Yes, we're gonna be quick tonight. Okay. Uh, Tom or Sue, who's gonna do legislative? Our, our next meeting is December 4th, and our advocacy, I'm sorry? Trip is the ninth. Yes, the advocacy trip is on the Monday the 9th, and we have four people going from Webster. Five. Is there five? Tom's? And Brian, okay. right? Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Cool. Fritz, do you have anything on labor? I 
do. I was able to go to the labor relations meeting last, or this past Wednesday, and uh, Ken Casey from Saney's, that is the State Administrators Association, was there to present, and Tom Gillette from NYSET, the New York State Teachers Union, was also there to present. They talked a little bit about the history of their respective organizations and, and also talked about um, what they're hearing from their membership with regards to Common Core um, testing, how they're working with the superintendents groups, and it was, uh, it was very informative. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Ryan, who's the director of the Monroe Oleans, or Oleans Accountability Assessment and Reporting Services, presented a report on the data uh, dashboard system. And after hearing the presentation, questions were raised uh, around the issue of PIN numbers for those who will get access to the dashboard. Uh, there were concerns about the security of the information, and there were concerns about the purpose for the use of the information, plus concerns about the hidden costs of the system. So there's a lot of concerns, and there weren't a lot of answers. So this will have to be definitely investigated before any decisions are made. Uh, Tom, would you like to report anything from NISBA? State School Board, so we'll be actually having hosting a conference tomorrow with, uh, with the commissioner in the afternoon. Right. So we'll be able to repeat some of the same things Adele talked about. Good. Do you need anything on the audit? We have nothing. Nothing good? Well, Sue, you want to remind us of a policy meeting? December 10th. Thank you. All right, board members, you've had a chance to take a look at the consent agenda. It includes um, minutes of our regular meetings, the personnel actions, the recommendations on the Committee on Special Education, and recommendations on the Committee on Preschool Education. May we have a motion to approve the consent agenda tonight? Thank you, Mike. So, second. Sue seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Before we ask for adjournment, I want to point out that Tuesday is the Senior Citizens Day at uh, Webster Schrader. And our next meeting is December 5th, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. With that being said, may we entertain an oh. Okay. Kind of robotics. Um, I do want to thank the Moltons that run it for Pike North. They do a great job. Uh, I, I, and uh, it was amazing the time they spend at Pike North at their house. They got a, one of those big things set up in the garage. Uh, they did a great job this year. The kids learned a lot. It came together great. And they're going to win because they're called the Angry Bricks. There you go. Okay. May we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Good night, everyone. Thank you.